Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here today. Welcome to City of God. If you are new here, my name's Tim. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Always, always a joy to be here with you, especially on those mornings that I have the privilege of digging in and teaching God's Word, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we're going to be continuing in our sermon series through the book of Hebrews today. We are finishing off chapter 3. Before we get into that, though, I want to share with you uh, something that happened uh, recently, and I don't actually think I've told my wife this yet, so you're going to be so proud, sweetheart. Uh, so here's what happened. Beautiful day like today, I'm driving down the road, and I drive past a sign that says, Caution, one lane road up ahead. And it's sunny, and I'm thinking, you know, what, you know, is there construction or something? So I'm driving, I'm kind of looking up ahead, and I don't see anything. And I'm looking around thinking, what's, what's going on? There's no flaggers or anything. And then I do happen to notice a few small, just little guys, the orange cones in my lane. They're not even like the tall traffic ones, you know. And the sign had only been maybe a couple hundred feet before these cones. And so, again, I'm in the cone lane. I look over, and the traffic next to me is just whizzing by nonstop. And I'm thinking, now I have to slow down, turn on my turn signal, wait, or... <laughs> Option B, <laughs> I'm eyeing those cones up there thinking, I, I'm in a Civic, <laughs> and that gap in the middle of those middle cones looks like I could maybe just squeeze through, and I'm looking, are there any cops? There's no cops monitoring these cones. I could probably maybe just clip one, be good to go, uh, but I don't have much time, so I have to make, and thankfully, thankfully, told you you'd be proud, my better judgment won the day. I merged and was impatient and merged over and went in the right lane. Man, when I drove past those cones, I looked over, and they had dug the Grand Canyon out of the street right behind those cones, and I think it would have swallowed up every single car in Lafayette. I was so glad that I didn't drive in there. I thought, man, the cops would just come and laugh at you. I don't even think they write you a ticket as they pull you out of that ditch. So I share that, not completely unrelated to the passage we're going to be in today, it just struck me, in fact, that in Hebrews 3, in a sense, I feel like this is God. Uh, kind of taking some big traffic cones and setting them in our path and saying, warning, there's great danger up ahead. You need to change lanes. Come back into the lane of following me. Don't keep going this way. Really bad things are going to happen. So, <clears throat> we're, again, we're finishing off the back half of Hebrews chapter 3, and as we do this, I want to look at three things in particular. First one being God's voice. The second thing being our response. And finally, our community. Those three things. Let me pray for us, and then I'll read our passage for us today. God, we come before you. Just so grateful, Lord, that you are who you say you are. So grateful that you welcome us into your presence. Um, through the work, through the finished work of your Son on the cross, we are able to come before you. God, we come humbly and just confessing that we are very needy today. We want your presence. We need your presence. God, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit May he fill this place. God, may your Holy Spirit fill our hearts today and transform us from the inside out that you, Jesus, might be lifted high in our hearts and in our city and in this room. Jesus, we need you. We love you. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Okay, Hebrews 3, we're going to start in verse 7. It says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Okay, there's a lot here. Let's zoom in and start with our first point, which is God's voice. God's voice. 
Our passage starts this morning telling us that we have a speaking God. If you've been around church any length of time, that is not surprising to you, that our God is a speaking God. It starts off, today if you hear His voice. But though we do take that for granted, God's a speaking God, stop and think for a bit uh, what, that, what that means. If God is all that we say He is and think He is, then He is the creator of all. He is ruling and reigning on the throne of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, able to do whatever He wants. Then why would this all-powerful deity uh, condescend to speak to us mere mortals when He's under no obligation to do so? Why would He do that? The mere fact that God speaks to us should be an indication to us of His character. It absolutely is. God speaks because He loves us. He loves us like crazy, and He wants us to know Him. He speaks so that we might know Him, because that is the best thing for us. And He speaks so that we might be set free from our sins, because that is absolutely our greatest need. He is speaking out of His love for us. Are we listening to Him? He speaks to guide us along the path of greatest blessing for our life. He's guiding us every step of the way, and that path happens to be the one walking hand in hand with him in close personal fellowship to the abundant life, in the abundant life. He's walking with us, speaking to guide us every step of the way. Our lives will absolutely be transformed from the inside out the more we begin to believe and realize that God's commands that we find in His Word are a blessing for us and not a burden. His commands are a blessing and not a burden. God's voice is life for us. Jesus Himself said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. We desperately need them. Consider with me just a few of the ways that God's word will, God's voice will dramatically impact your life. Have, have any of you, maybe I'm the only one, felt just lonely and, and starting to feel like you're in the desert and your soul is just dry and, and you're feeling desperate for just a drop of hope and love? God's voice cries out, my soul clings to the dust, give me life according to your word, Psalm 119. When our soul is barren, his voice is life to us. God's voice is power. Have you ever felt like you just could not overcome the temptations in your life? Have you ever felt like the stronghold of sin was more than you could muster to overcome? God's voice is the power we need. Praise God. Psalm 29, we read, The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Throughout the word, we are told God's voice is the strongest power in the universe. Nothing can stand against his voice, least of all, your sin. God's voice is power. Finally, God's voice, as I've said, is guidance, is warning, leading us on the path of great blessing. God's voice says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, Psalm 119. You know, if you're walking along by yourself in the dark, you're going to be tripping, banging your shins, and falling into the ditch more often than you'd like to admit. Guys, we all need a light for our path, and that's God's voice. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. To harden your heart is to fail to recognize God is trying to help you. To harden your heart is to think you know better than God, and so you choose to go your own way. And again, hear me when I say this. Every time you do that, ignoring God, believing you know better and going your own way, you're trying to squeeze between cones, and there is destruction waiting on that path. There is. We must believe this. We have. <laughs> If it's so vital that we hear God's voice and obey for our own good, then it's worth asking, how do we do this? How can we hear God's voice? Where do we hear God's voice? God speaks to us in a variety of ways. He, he does. He speaks to us in a variety of ways. Uh, Psalm 19 tells us that 
we hear God's voice in what He has made in creation. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. That means in this beautiful weather, when you're admiring a sunset, or you're come wintertime, you're looking at the beauty and the intricacies of a snowflake, you should absolutely hear your Creator God whispering, I'm here. I, I made this. Worship me. He's speaking. I'm sure we've probably all heard God speaking to us through the circumstances that we're going through in life. God's there with us. And as things are going on in our life, He's the one guiding us. Or we hear Him speaking to us through the voice of our conscience and our soul, just guiding us, you know, back towards Him when we're starting to drift. Or we hear Him through the voice of a loving friend or family member doing just that again, warning us, turn from this path, turn back to Jesus pointing us back to His faithfulness. These are all ways that God speaks to us. But the place that we must absolutely go to hear from God, to hear the voice of our living God, we must go to His written Word in the Bible. Because whatever else we might think we are hearing from God, whatever other message we think we're receiving Him, every single time we must take that back to the written Word of God, because that is the only place where we can be absolutely certain that we are hearing from Him perfectly. It's been recorded to us. It's the perfect Word. He's never going to give you a message somewhere else that contradicts what He's already saying to you in His Word. God will not contradict Himself. We must come to His Word every time. Take a second and notice with me how our passage today begins. The author, the, the, tech, the passage we read begins with a lengthy quotation from Psalm 95. And Psalm 95 was written, humanly speaking, by King David. But look, the author of Hebrews doesn't attribute it primarily to King David. He said it's God himself speaking this word. Starts off, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... This is a message from God. He wants us to know that. If you came in, I, good news, if you came in wanting a message from God today, this is a message from God today for all of us. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Every word is important. Look at what it does not say. It doesn't say, as the Holy Spirit said, past tense. He's not saying, look, I want to tell you what God was saying to them a long time ago. He says, as the Holy Spirit says, present tense. He's wanting you to see this is God still speaking this same word to all of us today. God is speaking. And this isn't the only place in God's word where this is God speaking. I've got to find these places where God is speaking. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all Scripture is breathed out by God. All of it. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. If you need to hear from the Lord, when you need to hear from the Lord, and you need to hear from the Lord, open the book. God is speaking. Are we coming to him humbly to listen? God loves us. Again, because of his great, great love for us, his voice is there to guide us. And if we believe this, if, his voice is, if we believe that his voice is for our good, it will be reflected in how we are walking in obedience to it. It absolutely will be. So this brings us to our second point. Second point, our response. As we come to God and He is speaking to us, how do we respond? How should we respond? <clears throat> the example of Israel in the wilderness, which is spelled out for us here in Hebrews 3, that example is um, instructive to us in more ways than one. Because all of Israel's story of their salvation from Egypt, their travels and travails through the wilderness on into the promised land, these are, this is a living, breathing illustration for all of us and the spiritual journey that we all go on with the Lord from God saving us out of darkness and bringing us into light. So we have much to learn from it. Just as Israel were slaves to the Egyptians, we were all once slaves to our great enemies of sin and death. Jesus himself in John 8, 34 says to us, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And this terrifying passage, Ephesians chapter 2, as you read it, you realize 
He's describing all of our lives prior to coming to faith in Christ and saying essentially we were all like puppets on a string, just following the whims of Satan himself. Satan himself, slaves to sin, slaves to Satan. Guys, our situation was a lot more dire than Israel and Egypt. Satan is way worse than the worst of the Egyptian taskmasters. But though they did absolutely nothing to deserve it, God graciously stepped down out of heaven and rescued them from Egypt. In an unparalleled display of glory and power, it was awesome. Think about this. He's describing the Israelites in the wilderness. Every single one of them had had a front row seat to what God accomplished in the Exodus. They saw the ten plagues God sent on the Egyptians. The frogs, the flies, the river turned to blood. It's a lot of weird stuff. If that wasn't enough, remember they march out there, they get out of Egypt, and they come up to the Red Sea, and now they're hemmed in. The Egyptian army changed, mind, changed their mind, is hot on their tail, and God parts the Red Sea before them and leads them through on dry ground. They get out on the other side, and you can almost hear them as they turn around, and Egypt is following them, and then all of a sudden, the Red Sea comes crashing back down, wiping out the Egyptians once and for all. And that, Can you imagine how it dawns on them? From fear to elation, we're free. For the first time in our life, we're free. We've been saved. And though that rescue and that exodus was incredible, the exodus brought about through the death of Jesus on the cross was infinitely more miraculous and permanent in its effects because through Jesus' death on the cross, he offers us new life. The dead come to life. And once and for all, he forever puts into the grave sin and hell and every power of darkness. Our exodus is so much greater than theirs was. And I'm not just, I mean, it sounds cool to say they had an exodus, we had an exodus. The Bible describes it this way as our exodus. I love the story in Luke chapter 9 on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus takes his best friends up there, Peter, James, and John. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is all uh, shining like the sun. Listen to what happens. Luke chapter 9. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That word departure is the word exodus. They were speaking to him about the exodus he was about to accomplish. Our exodus. The exodus of the entire human race as every weight of every sin was placed upon his innocent shoulders. And though he did nothing to deserve it, the waters of God's wrath, just like the Red Sea, came crashing down on him, crushing him in our place. So that as he rises and is resurrected to newness of life, he now holds out that option, that opportunity to you to receive new life to confess your sins, repent, and come to him in faith. That offer is available today. Have faith in Christ, and you too will be saved. You will spend forever in glory with God himself. For some of you here today, you've heard this message before. God's word today is, do not harden your hearts. Hear it and believe today. Jesus' offer is for you today. He's standing here waiting if you'll just come to him. We're going to have, after this message, there'll be people praying on the back wall. Go back and talk to somebody. Receive salvation today. Don't harden your hearts. Get up and go talk to somebody right now. For the rest of us, God's word to us is, do not harden your hearts. Do not harden your hearts as they did. Pay close attention to what Israel did in response to their great salvation. Their response was abysmal. Don't do like they did. Now, <clears throat> to, I wish I had time to go through all their response and their whole story in the book of Exodus and Numbers and all. I'm fascinated by it, and it's amazing, but we don't have time for that. So just to abbreviate their response, I'd like to give it to you from the way this one author, I love the way he states their response. How did Israel respond to this amazing Exodus? He says, the God of the universe had just tossed around the most powerful man on the face of the earth like a toddler with a rag doll. God didn't just humble Pharaoh, he broke his spirit and revealed Pharaoh's impotence. 
a slave people and their God left him and his nation in shambles. This display of power sent vibrations throughout the world, inspiring fear and awe. Everybody heard about this. Yet Israel's response to this spectacular deliverance from Egypt is not mainly praise, worship, and wholehearted trust. Instead, Israel responds with grumbling, complaining, murmuring, and quarreling. And we think, how is that possible? How could anyone see what they had seen and walk through and experience this tremendous salvation and respond in any way other than just falling on their faces in humble adoration for the king and for the salvation they'd received? And when the second we start to think that, we should think about ourselves and say, well, what is my response? How do I respond to the salvation I've received? Again, you can read their story uh, in the books of Exodus, Numbers, all these Old Testament books. You should read these books. The stories of Israel in the wilderness, they're not just stories, they're real life. This is history, and it's all instructive to us of what God did with them, for them, through them, their response, all teaching us. It's, you should absolutely read those stories. As you do, you should start to feel some like sympathy for these people. These are real people. And yes, God had worked for them an amazing salvation. He had, they could not set themselves free from Egypt. God did it for them. And yet, think of this, that was all they'd ever known. That was, I mean, it was bad, but it was their comfort zone. And God had taken them out of that and now brought them, plopped them down in the wilderness where they had essentially nothing. And now they need to trust in God for every, their everyday daily needs. Um, as a parent, I can, you know, they had kids and stuff too. How do you feed them? How do you, where's water coming from? And so you, you, you see this in their story. Um, as soon as they start to run out of food and water, that's when the complaints start to come, and they start saying, God, how could you do this to us? What are you doing? Are you trying to t just torture us? This is worse than Egypt. Send, you know, and on and on and on, complaints and murmuring. They're fighting with each other. They're fighting with Moses. They're saying all these terrible things. That sort of response is understandable. It's like, well, yeah, of course they did that. And yet, when you respond that way, that is a telltale sign of a heart that is turning hard against God. They knew what God had done to save them. We know what God has done to save us, and yet our unbelief prevents us from now trusting that same God to meet our daily needs. Thank you, God, for saving me. Awesome. I guess I'm going to figure the rest of this out on my own. We don't say that, but that's how we live a lot of times. Their unbelief so blinded them that they actually started begging to be sent back to slavery in Egypt. They said that would be preferable to trying to walk by faith in you, God, which is crazy. They got, this is the most epic instance of hangry in human history, and they cry out, Exodus 16.3, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the meat pots, oh, life was great. We ate bread to the full, but you've brought us out to this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I hate that I hear my own voice in that. We say and do crazy things in our unbelief. So if we're going to learn from their poor response, we should ask, what should they have done? What should they have done? They did uh, run out of food and run out of water. And obviously, God is the one that's brought them to this place. God knew what they were going to face. What did God expect from them? I was thinking, this is what I was chewing on as I'm studying this passage. What did God want from them? Was, he just want, was his message, guys, make the best of this bad situation? Come on now. Fashion some shovels. Start digging some wells. Come on, guys. God wanted them to remember their salvation. And from that, to see him for who he is. The Israelites in the wilderness, all of us here today, we must believe that the God who loved us enough to save us is the same God who loves us enough to meet our everyday needs. The same God. He has not changed. If he loved us enough to save us, he will now take care of our every need. That is the gospel message that we must preach to our own hearts that is the message that will prevent us from trying to squeeze through those cones and crashing our whole life. We need to say, God will care for me. God loves me. I'm going to stay with him. 
We must preach this message to our hearts every day. God wants us to come to him in humble faith, recognizing he alone can satisfy our every need. In the wilderness, the Israelites sinned. They did a lot of bad behaviors. You'll read all about them in the book. We, here, they were accusing God of being like murderous and evil. That's bad. Don't do that. Um, God gave them lots of instructions. Live this way. Do these things. He sent them manna from heaven, free food. Just rain down every day. And he's just like, just collect it this way. Do it, don't do it this way. They disregarded all of his instructions and said, yeah, we're going to do it how we want. They took their jewelry and fashioned a little gold calf and said, you are the God who saved us from Egypt. They did all kinds of terrible behaviors. But all of their sinful behavior was simply symptoms of the the deadly heart condition of unbelief. That was the problem. Unbelief in God in their hearts. I say that to say this. Let us think of our own lives. What are the sins that you're struggling with right now? What are the temptations that we keep giving into over and over again? We give into sinful behaviors. Uh, let us So there's the behavior. Let me dial that back and say, hey, point at my heart and say, what is that revealing? What unbelief is that pointing out in my heart? What am I not trusting God for that's causing me to behave this way? Unbelief is the problem. We sin because we think we know better than God how to to satisfy our own desires. We turn to sin because we don't trust God that he has our best interests in hearts. Or Uh, This is a big one for me. We turn to sin because we have been trying to trust God, and we've been waiting, and we feel like we've been waiting too long. And we get impatient. We say, God, I thought you were going to do something by now. Now I'm going to take care of it myself. Impatience. Again, that's a big one for me. Uh, So these are temptations that we all face. These are the This is what makes it so difficult. Some of the things that makes it so difficult to try and trust God and continue following him by faith is all of these things. And so I want to give us a little encouragement. I am obviously far from perfect, but the Lord has worked for me and in me an amazing work. Uh, He has turned my life around completely. And again, I'm not saying that I'm uh, perfect by any stretch, but I want to share with you just a couple of the things that God has shown me, a couple of his promises, really, that have helped me to learn how to follow him in obedience, because I hope this will be an encouragement for all of us. So I've shared my story from stage before, so I won't share all of it today. I'll grab coffee with you if you want to hear more of it sometime. Let me just share a little bit what God has taught me, um, because obviously I haven't always been a pastor, um, but my parents did raise me in the church. And so I spent years hearing the gospel and believing the gospel that Jesus had died on the cross for my sins. And yet, I didn't really know where life was to be found in terms of, I still felt empty on the inside. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. Now, how can I possibly deal with all this emptiness, loneliness, whatever it is that's going on inside of me? I'm chasing everything else in the world trying to fill that void. And I turned to the standard things that you might think of, turn to things like pornography, pursuing academic excellence and achievement. I even turned to alcohol for far too long, thinking surely one of these things can give me what it is that I'm looking for. All the while going to church and just feeling guilty and shame all the time for the sin I couldn't seem to let go of. Finally, it got to the point where it's like, enough. I cannot do this anymore. One foot in the church, one foot in the world, I, I still remember I was living in Pheasant Run, this junky apartment, and I was just like, I, there's got to be a better way. I fell on my face and said, God, I'm missing something. What, if, there, if there's anything else, show me what I'm missing. Set me free from this. I can't live like this anymore. And he met me there. Miraculously, he met me there. And he totally turned my life around. And step one for that was bringing me to his word, was speaking to me through his voice, because hope and freedom are available to all of us through the beautiful sound of his voice. I want to share with you just two promises that really have been anchors for my soul and helped me to continue following in obedience, albeit imperfectly. But these promises, I think, are really, really good. So let me share just a couple of my favorites. First one is Romans 8.32. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, with him, graciously give us all things? 
I call that gospel logic, from the greater to the lesser. Basically saying, if God went to all this trouble to bring you out of darkness to where you are now, you really think He's going to leave you hanging now? Or in other words, uh, if God has already met your greatest possible need at the greatest possible cost to Himself, for us, the death of His only Son, He has given everything to bring you to salvation. And now, whatever you're asking Him for, whatever you have need of, compared to what He's already given, is like a cup of water. And we live like we're, we think God is a stingy God saying, I, I, that's too much. Water, I, I can't do that. It's gospel logic. The second <clears throat> promise that God brought to me, God opened my heart to see and just really helped me to cling to and live out of, uh, is I, I try and share this verse every time I get up on stage. It's kind of like a life verse for me. Philippians 4.19 says this, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God shall supply all your needs. Again, God's voice, God's word is filled with his promises to us. And he wants these promises to be anchors for our soul, that out of them we can then trust and believe and follow in obedience. Because if we're not living by these, if we're not clinging to these, we're going to be tossed around by every wave of sea, uh, temptation, emotion. We need his promises. God, my God shall supply all of your needs. He doesn't say he will give you everything that you want, but he promises to supply your every need. And he made this promise knowing we are super needy people. We got all kinds of needs, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, and he's right there saying, I will supply your every need. Believe in me. Can you believe in me? According to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus, he has an infinite supply of grace for our every need. He's never going to run out. And so we need to come to him in faith, ask him, and here's the kicker, we need to wait for him. Waiting is so hard, but we need to wait for him because God says he will promise us. He will supply our every need, but he doesn't say I'm going to do it instantaneously. We need to just trust in him. The Bible talks in a lot of places about waiting on God. We need to trust that he is working while we're waiting. We need to trust that his timing is perfect and we're not alone as we wait. Believe that he knows what's best for us. We know that God is good. Waiting, I know in this room there's, that a lot of you have been waiting for God for a long time. And you have great needs. And I, it's hard. Waiting is hard. Can you wait just a little longer with him? C can you cling to his promises for just a little bit longer? Don't turn away now. Don't start walking down that road towards unbelief and hardening your heart. Guys, waiting is super hard. I, Isaiah 40, I love this word. This always strengthens me and as I wait. Isaiah 40 says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Trust in him. Wait for him. Don't harden your heart. Okay, this brings us to our last point. Final point, our community. God's voice, our response, our community. As we were just alluding to, living by faith is a tremendous blessing. It's the key as we live by faith in God and walking in obedience. That's the key to the abundant life. It absolutely is. But by definition, faith is a challenge. It's not easy. Faith means we are trusting God to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's really hard to do, trusting in this invisible God. That's hard. It's hard to do on our best days. It feels impossible on the days when we're struggling. So this is why the Bible encourages us and tells us you need community. You need a community of believers around you. For when your hope starts to fall and their faith is strong, their faith is for you. And they lift your eyes and your heart back to heaven. We all need that. Hear me when I say this. Faith is hard, and sin is real easy. This is why drifting away from God, hardening our hearts, is a very real temptation that we all face regularly because faith is hard and sin's real easy. So 
Verse 12 says to us, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That's the warning. Take care because any one of us are vulnerable to having an evil, unbelieving heart leading us away from God. Take care. How do we do this? How do we take care? Verse 13, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another every day. Exhort is a weird word. I, you know, it's not something I use a lot. Maybe you use exhort a lot. So I looked it up. Exhort, to strongly encourage or try to persuade someone to do something. To strongly encourage, exhort one another every day. Strongly encourage one another. Persuade one another to believe and to obey. This is, we're instructed to do this for one another. We are to be here for one another. We need one another. Exhort one another every day. This is a radical community that's being described here. They exhort one another every day. The author is assuming that those who are hearing this message have people in their lives who know them really well. He's assuming that the people who hear this have people in their lives who have rejoiced with them in their successes, have wept with them in their sorrows. He's assuming these people have close community of people, of believers, who care deeply about them. That's the picture of Christian community that we get in the New Testament, which unfortunately is in stark contrast to what we find in most of our modern, western, highly individualistic societies. They lived in community. Unfortunately, too often, we relentlessly pursue success, money, pleasure, all these things that we believe are going to give us fullness of life, but we pursue them far too often at the expense of one of God's greatest blessing to us, which is Christian community. Christian community right here in the church. Time for growing deep connection with other believers is often just not one of our top priorities. The author of Hebrews wants us to know that Christian community is not a luxury for those who just happen to have the space in their schedule. Oh, man, that must be awesome for them. I'd love to have that, but dot, dot, dot. No, we cannot have that perspective. <clears throat> he wants us to know that without the encouragement of our friends, any one of us, again, will fall prey to the temptations of sin. Because sin is deceitful. Sin is deceitful. Sometimes it's blatantly obvious, and it's terrible. You turn on the news, you hear a horrible thing, you're like, that is the worst thing ever. That is obviously sin. But all too often, sin is very subtle, and its temptations look really alluring to us, and we are like masters at deceiving ourselves and justifying what we choose to do. We say things like, you know, it's no big deal if I just, just a little harmful flirtation with this person in my office, not a big deal. Or so what if I drink one or two more drinks? I'm, you know, it's not, I'm not an alcoholic. Or I, I'm not, no one else is getting hurt by what I'm looking at on my phone. This is just me. I'm stressed. Not, it's not a big deal. And on and on and on. Again, like, we find ways to manipulate to where, eh, it's not that big a deal for us. This is, we, you need somebody in your life to say, hey, hey, watch out. You're drifting. Hear the voice of God today. Hear the voice of God to you today. It is absolutely urgent that you recognize the danger of living in isolation. We must see this. One of my new favorite authors, Justin Whitmore Early, he says this. The route of the enemy is always to pull you, pull you aside and tell you lies about who you are and who God is because you are most vulnerable when you are alone. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I've seen that to be true in my own life. His book, Made for People, and there's a subtitle, super helpful, super good for learning the ins and outs, the whys for how we, why we need community and how to grow it. I highly recommend it. Justin Early, Made for People. He says what the author of Hebrews is telling us also. We need people to know us. We need people to love us enough to ask us uncomfortable questions. We need people who love us enough to say something again when they recognize our hearts are drifting away from the Lord. We need to be these kind of people for our friends. Am I willing enough? Do I care about them enough to brave the uncomfortable and speak the truth in love to them? We need to be that for our friends. 
We need to remind one another of the God who loved us enough to send his son to die on a cross for us. The band can come up. We're almost done. Just a couple more words of encouragement for us. We need to share our testimonies of how we have seen God come through for us in our time of need. We need to encourage one another what we have seen of God's faithful love. Man, I could tell what a blessing I have had from the people in this church who have taken the time to sit down with me and my wife and share with us. And it's always, it never ceases to amaze me how they've gone through very similar things and then to, show, to describe what they saw God do for them lifts us back up, gives us hope, and we're starting to think, how's this going to work out? It's going to be terrible. And they remind us, God is faithful. He is good. We need those testimonies. How do we do this? How can we have a community like this? God, obviously, it doesn't just happen. You don't just stumble into community without effort, <laughs> without doing something to get it. So how do we do it? For some of us, it will mean strongly considering getting plugged into one of the avenues that we have available here at the church. Get plugged into one of our city groups. Go, get plugged into the men's ministry or the women's ministry. Guys, I know probably every single one of you got handed a flyer when you came here today. There's a men's retreat coming up. This, guys, here's the thing. Women typically do this a little better, a lot better than we do. Just naturally, like they're better at connecting and opening up and being honest and all that. Guys, come on. The enemy has got his target set squarely on your heart. He is out to destroy your life. Community will help you tremendously. Give it more than a second glance. Recognize your dire need for that. Consider this. Men's ministry, men's retreat, city groups. It'll be worth it. For all of us, hear this. Just because you are surrounded by people does not mean that you are letting anyone truly know you. You can be surrounded in a crowd and still be hiding what's going on in your life. We're experts at it. This means we need to be willing to be vulnerable. We have to be humble enough to open up and admit our struggles, admit our fears. A crazy thought as a, as a Christian, admit that you are a sinner struggling with sin and you need someone to pray with you. You need someone's accountability. You have to open up. We need to be known and we need to trust that the people God has brought into our lives will love us enough not to throw shame on us, not to say how dare you, but will love us enough to point us back to our Savior and pray for us when we are weak. Justin Early again says, a friend is someone who knows you fully and loves you anyway. To me, that sounds an awful lot like the friend we have in Jesus, and we all need to be friends like that. Let's pray.